Λοιπόν, προχωράμε γρήγορα στην τελευταία συνεδρία που είναι... που δεν έχω τα γυαλιά μου, τα ξέχασα. Που είναι λοιπόν ένα τραπέζι το οποίο το κάναμε με αφορμή την α, έναρξη λειτουργίας. Κάναμε λοιπόν ε, το τραπέζι αυτό με αφορμή την έναρξη λειτουργίας ενός καινούριου τμήματος στο διάθλαση, το οποίο αφορά την ηλεκτροφυσιολογία του οφθαλμού. Το έχει αναλάβει η συνάδελφος η κυρία Καταρίνα Παπαδοπούλου να το τρέξει και ήδη έχει αρχίσει να το δουλεύει. Και με την ευκαιρία αυτή έχουμε καλέσει και μία μοριακή βιολόγο η οποία ασχολείται με τις γονιδιακές εξετάσεις και μία εξπέρ του είδους της ηλεκτροφυσιολογίας, την κυρία Μαρίνα Ζαρκ Βίτμαρ από τη Σλοβενία η οποία έχουμε τιμή να είναι μαζί μας. Μαρτίνα Ζαρκ Βίτμαρ is consultant in neurophalmology and medical retina at University Eye Hospital in Ljubljana, Slovenia. She has a special interest in electrophysiology. Besides clinical training in Ljubljana, she received further training at Stanford University USA and Moorfield Eye Hospital, Great Britain. She received EBO grant Uh, for outstanding result in Paris. She was ranked first overall at the, that exam in 2005. Uh, Mrs. Wittmar, I would like to invite you to give your talk about electrophysiology in everyday practice. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear organizers, First, I would like to thank you to invite me here and give me the opportunity to talk about electrophysiology. As we all know, this includes a battery of tests that's used to obtain the um, obje objective uh, visual function, uh, we, uh, to objectively assess the function of the visual pathway from the retinal pigment epithelium and photoreceptors to the visual cortex. Uh, here we see a schematic view of the eye and we know that from the retinal pigment epithelium the test that tells us the most is electrooculography. The second test we use is so-called uh, full field ERG. It shows the function of cones and rods and uh, we have uh, here the cone response, the rod response and a mixed response. Here we have to be aware that the A wave shows the function of rot and cones, whereas the B wave shows the function of Miller cells and on bipolar cells. Uh, we have another cone response, so-called 30 Hz response, and uh, we also have a pattern ERG response. This is a response that's showing the function of the macula, and it has so-called P50 and N95 wave. The first one shows the function of the macula and the N95, the function of ganglion cells. And the last response um, for the macula, it's so-called multifocal ERG, which uh, shows uh, very nicely the function of the fovea. Uh, at the end, we also record visual evoked potentials, which show the function of the optic nerve, the, chias the chiasm and retrochiasmal pathway. <coughs> Uh, all this uh, we have to do according to the ISEF standards. ISEF is an international society for clinical electrophysiology of vision. The first, uh, I will first describe this uh, test shortly. You all know about EOG. Uh, you know that you have a dark through and a light peak in normal people, whereas in patients with best dystrophy you don't have a light peak due to abnormal function of the RPE and photoreceptors. Uh, and Arden ratio normally is more than 1.8, but in best patients it's around 1. Why is EOG important nowadays? Uh, here I will show a Slovene family with a confirmed mutation. You will see the grand-grandmother that had already changes in her fundus, then her son and her daughter. The daughter had abnormal EOG. This white here means that they all had abnormal EOG but she didn't have any fundus changes yet. They might still develop later in life. These are her two daughters, both normal, but the grand-grandchildren, uh, it's interesting that two of them have abnormal EOG and we have to follow them closely, both of them. 
One have, has typical yellowish lesions in the fovea, uh, and the other one has just some slight changes on the OCT. The other two cousins, we don't need to follow them up because EOG was normal. It means they don't have the disease and they will not develop the disease. Why do we have to follow them? Because one of these uh, small boys developed um, hemorrhage in his uh, left macula and with OCT and fluorescein, we saw that this was a classic CNV. And as you know, now treatment is available. So he got two injections of anti-VGF and his vision improved. So EOG nowadays, it's important to tell if the patient will, might develop disease later in life or we don't need to follow them up. Uh, the next test is so-called standard full-field ERG. As I already said, we have different responses. Three of them are measured in the dark. This is the maximal response. I said that A wave shows the function of photoreceptors and B wave function of on bipolar cells. This is the ROT response, the oscillatory potentials, they show the function of the emacrine cells. Uh, and then we have two cone responses. Uh, one is here and the other is so-called 30 hertz flicker response. We don't use coronal electrodes in Slovenia. Instead, we use HK loop electrodes that were um, developed by our professor, Marco Holina, that you probably met. Uh, we put them in the lower fornix and they, are also, they can also be used in children. Uh, another, uh, full, uh, another response that shows the generalized photoreceptor function, it's so-called flash ERG. Uh, but the problem with this um, full field ERGs are that don't show uh, very well the macular function. So when we suspect that the patient has problems in the macula, we should do pattern ERG or multifocal ERG. Pattern ERG is a response to a checkerboard stimulus. We said that we have two waves. P50 shows the macular function and N95, the ganglion cell function. So it will be reduced in optic nerve diseases. Uh, another macular test, it's multifocal ERG. Here we, set, we have 61 hexagons that uh, turn on and off randomly. And with mathematical um, function, we get the responses. If the patient fixates nicely, we see such a nice peak. Uh, otherwise, we see all that traces that uh, can be uh, also expressed in the rings. So this is the first ring, then we have a second ring, the third, fourth, and the fifth ring. And uh, it's a cone-driven bipolar cell response. And very importantly, it will be normal if there is optic nerve disease. So this distinguishes optic nerve disease from macular dysfunction. Uh, the last, it's so-called VP. As I said, we record it uh, at the um, back of the eye, uh, of the head, and the time uh, of the signal to travel from the retina to the visual cortex, it's around 100 milliseconds, so we call that wave P100. Um, and uh, these electrical potentials show the function of the primary visual cortex, uh, of the optic nerve, chiasm, and retiochiasmal visual pathway. Why are we using all these electrodiagnostic tests? It's usually performed in large referral centers that have expertise in obtaining and then interpreting the results. We always have to, uh, to see the patient as a, as a whole, so we need other data about visual acuity, visual fields, uh, how the fundus looks like. Uh, it's mostly used uh, in our country um, for patients with unexplained visual acuity loss. So they might either uh, lose visual acuity, they might have visual field scotomas, or they might have just some visual disturbances. Uh, we use it in retinal dystrophies. It's very important uh, to use it in toxic um, cases. It will be also shown by, by your Greek colleague and uh, we can use it in suspected neuritis, and uh, I will show how it's also important in children, and especially with infants with nystagmus. Um, we all know that medically unexplained visual loss can be uh, really uh, a disease that signs might not yet be detected, not yet present, or more often patients are just malingering, they have some psychoorganic causes for vision loss, and that there is no organic disease behind. 
uh, usually these are female, this is usually bilateral, and they have concentric visual field loss. There was a nice article published from cheap <coughs> to more expensive tests that we can use in these patients. So here the tests are listed. We usually do these cheap tests to everyone, as you all know, Amsler, color vision, testing of the pupils, confrontation visual field. Then we do Goldman perimetry, 30 degree visual field, and 10 degree visual field. Uh, we use autofluorescence, as uh, everybody else does. We know that a normal autofluorescence has a small hypoautofluorescent spot in the macula due to accumulation of the macular pigment. And we can have many different um, patterns of autofluorescence depending on the disease. Um, we also use microperimetry. We find it even better than octopus, uh, as it shows the retinal sensitivity directly on the fundus. And also it tells us about the fixation. Very good method is to combine autofluorescence with microperimetry. This is a patient with cone dystrophy. We see that he has here hypoautofluorescent region that's not functioning. It's all red here. And the fixation shifted upwards to so-called preferred retinal locus. And uh, all around, the retinal sensitivity is normal. And in conjunction with this, we also use electrophysiology. So when we have a patient with unexplained visual loss, we should think uh, in a complex way. We should use functional tests, retinal morphology tests, such as OCT, OCTA, or fluorescein angiography. We use electrophysiology. And of course, we also use genetic studies and imaging. Uh, I will show five cases that came to our neuroophthalmology clinic with this unexplained vision loss. The first one, it's a lady that came with normal fundi and uh, low visual acuity. In Slovenia, we use Snellin vision uh, measurements. So this 0 0.1 means 10% of vision. It's still present. She had no big changes on the visual field, just some small changes on the macular top program. Uh, there were some few demyelinizating lesions in the brain, but her electrophysiology looked grossly abnormal. We did multifocal ERG, and you can see a very nice focal response, which means macula is functioning normally. As I said, in optic nerve disease, you will not have abnormal multifocal ERG. But what we see down here, you have a nice P50 wave, and you would expect N95 wave to be here, but it's gone. So bilaterally, we have loss of N95 response, and we also have very delayed and abnormal VEP. So this lady had an optic neuropathy. The other lady was 29 year old, years old. She had problems with color vision and bilaterally problems with reading. Uh, we didn't see anything with fluorescein and geography. Uh, microperimetry was not very abnormal, but on autofluorescence, we saw some hyperfluorescence in the fovea. Uh, we did um, microperimetry superimposed on the autofluorescence, and we see just two spots where retinal sensitivity is lower. We did electrophysiology. What we see here, it, this is a normal pattern ERG, and with her, P50 response is lower. Uh, but other uh, full-field ERG responses were normal. And what was very abnormal was multifocal ERG. In her, we didn't get a nice peak. Peak is away, you see, uh, in the contrast with the other patient. And you have grossly abnormal uh, these five rings where we test uh, the response. Here it's nicely shown how we test it in these five rings. So it's mostly abnormal in the inner ring. So this was a patient that uh, Stargardt mutation was negative. We don't really uh, know what's the cause. We think this is some occult maculopathy. But um, luckily, she has no progression of the disease, and the results look almost like they looked um, almost 14 years ago. So be careful. When you have a patient with maculopathies, uh, you can have delay in VEP but it's because pattern ERG is abnormal. So you always have to do both tests, do pattern ERG and do VP. Some neurologists uh, in our country, they do just VP and think if the latency is prolonged, this is optic neuropathy. Wrong. You have to do pattern ERG and multifocal ERG. Uh, the third case, uh, it's a 
65-year-old male that uh, had bilaterally poor vision, nothing on the fundus, some slightly abnormal hyperautofluorescence of the whole posterior pole, uh, microperimetry grossly abnormal. You see that he has eccentric and also very unstable fixation, some scotoma, and uh, on OCT, some slight changes in the macula. Uh, he had bilaterally abnormal multifocal ERG and also abnormal full field ERG. In his case, the cone responses were abnormal as well as 30 Hz response. So this was a cone dystrophy. Cone dystrophy, it's one of the cases where when just looking at the fundus, you cannot tell the diagnosis. And also genetic testing here, it's very complicated because many different genes might be involved. So electrophysiology is the, somehow the cheapest and the quickest way to tell what's wrong with that patient. Our fourth case, uh, it's a 61-year-old man that came with vision loss and shimmering. We asked him about his previous health diagnosis and he told us that he's healthy just four years before he had the pigmented nevus extracted. He had this very concentric visual field. The, uh, otherwise, no special things uh, were seen on the fundus, just some attenuation of the arteries. Uh, but he had uh, abnormal um, full field ERG, and we see that this is so-called melanoma-associated retinopathy. So here, this patient didn't know yet that he has a metastatic uh, malignant melanoma. So we were the first to tell, uh, to, to send him back to the oncology clinic and he got additional treatment. Uh, this here, it's uh, so-called neg uh, negative ERG. Uh, it is when uh, normally you have A wave and B wave and B wave is much bigger than A wave. But here it's a problem with this on bipolar cells. So B wave is very small. Uh, and you can also see it here on on-off responses. Uh, the electronegative ERG is a special form of ERG and there are like maybe six different diagnoses connected with it. And also one of these is carcinoma-associated retinopathy. So in both melanoma-associated retinopathy and in carcinoma-associated retinopathy, you have antibodies against the retinal cells. This is an autoimmune disease. Um, my last adult case is a lady that was taking chloroquine for uh, a long time. Uh, she had still normal visual acuity, but some small scotoma seen on the macular um, octopus. And what's typical for toxic, neuropathy, uh, toxic maculopathies is that the central ring is still normal, but the parafoveal ring is abnormal. And you have to calculate uh, the ratio between uh, the first and the second and the first and the third ring. In her case, you could already see some slight changes on the OCT, but they are much better seen with multifocal ERG. So a multifocal ERG in our country is obligatory in patients that are on a long-term chloroquine therapy, because with accumulation of chloroquine, uh, you might get irreversible changes. So in her case, she had to stop chloroquine and change it it's her rheumatologist that, pre that prescribes the drug, so they had to change it to something else. Um, just here it's a short summary. Uh, what I think it's most important is uh, be aware that in maculopathies, multifocal ERG is abnormal, and in optic nerve, it's normal. In optic nerve, you normally have abnormal N95 response. Uh, in this cone or cone rod dystrophies um, and rod dystrophies, um, in, for example, rod dystrophy such as RP, you will have still normal function in the center because the, like retinitis pigmentosa, it affects periphery first. So you will have abnormal just rod ERG responses. So this was first part of my talk and very briefly I will go through the use of electrophysiology in children, which I think it's very important. Um, um, if the children are bigger, we can use HK loop electrodes, but when they are smaller, we just use skin electrodes. So they, we put them here on the cheeks and they sit in the lap of the mother and the, the test is really not harmful. It's done very quickly and it tells us a lot about uh, what's going on. We use so-called GOS protocol. Uh, it's also used in Great Britain for children uh, until six years of age. Later on, we use this ISEF protocol. 
So the skin electrodes, they don't use it, for example, in the United States, but uh, we use it here in Europe. Why is electrophysiology important? You probably met in your practice children with nystagmus that develops at around third months of age, and uh, there you have to exclude sensoric uh, causes, which might, um, or ophthalmological causes that might cause the nystagmus. Uh, and I remember it as ABC. Here you have a list of diagnoses that's connected with all of them. And they have usually normal fundus, but electrophysiology will be grossly abnormal. So uh, our professor uh, uh, that's doing pediatric ophthalmology did a nice study on 37 children uh, with minimal fundus changes and they did electrophysio and with nystagmus. <laughs> And with electrophysiology, they found nine children with liver congenital amaurosis that you may be hurt. Now, uh, this disease might be treatable. Uh, with gene therapy, we found patients with congenital stationary night blindness, achromatopsia, chondral dystrophies, and some other. Uh, this is just a patient with a liver congenital amaurosis, and instead of nice uh, waves that you usually get with children, here uh, all is flat. So there is no ERG. Um, electrophysiology is also useful in children that come to us and they have so-called bilateral ambiopia, so their vision doesn't improve despite wearing glasses. You have to think about other causes of bad vision. Check refraction again, check the cornea, uh, look carefully for the optic nerve, it might be hypo hypoplastic, uh, there might be some retinal dystrophies behind. Here is uh, a, um, a girl that I saw at the age of 10 years and later at the age of 13 years. Uh, not much seen on the fundus alone. She has a sister with similar problems. On autofluorescence, you already see these flags around. Uh, the microperimetry showed that her fixation shifted upwards. OCT showed uh, grossly abnormal changes on her fundus. She has the sister uh, with similar problems, and in both of them, Stargardt was confirmed. Uh, they have bilaterally abnormal multifocal ERG. The younger sister has also abnormal photopic and scotopic responses, and the older just abnormal photopic responses. Why is this important? Because it tells us about the prognosis for the patient, and the one that just has comb problems has a better prognosis. Here are their relatives. If you would see these relatives, you might think, ah, oh, this is RP because they have some bone spicule. But in all of these patients, this was a homozygous Stargardt disease, which was confirmed genetically as well. Um, just three more cases uh, that come to our office uh, with uh, poor vision entering school. This is a boy that had um, retinoschisis on uh, electrophysiology. Again, you have this uh, negative ERG. When seeing this OCT, we gave him diamox and his edema improved and his vision got better. Then another patient that didn't comply about <coughs> night vision problems with electrophysiology, we confirmed uh, congenital stationary night blindness, which is very clearly seen with electrophysiology testing. Again, it's this negative ERG here. Uh, the fundus is completely normal, also, also out of fluorescence, OCT. So here, electrophysiology is um, the key um, diagnostic tool. And another boy with Usher syndrome, where you already see abnormal out of fluorescence and flat ERG. So to sum up, uh, in children, we use a lot out of fluorescence, uh, and in these bilateral so-called amblyopias, we use electrophysiology testing. Uh, and in adults, uh, it helps us to distinguish uh, the level of dysfunction. It helps us to objectively evaluate the retina, the optic nerve. We can see a carrier state, uh, let's say in best disease, and it's important in infants and children. Uh, so do electrophysiology when you are not sure, uh, is it retina or is it optic nerve? Do it when you see nothing at all on the fundus and you don't really know is the patient malingering or is it really ill. Um, it can tell you is the disease progressing uh, and you, you have to be aware that it's the only objective tool to assess the visual system uh, because visual acuity is still a subjective test. 
Uh, I would like to thank my co-workers, especially Professor Marco Haulina, that you probably know, uh, and Jelka Brezer, she, she was the founder of our electrophysiology lab in Ljubljana. Uh, she retired now, but now it's Maya Schuster that's doing electrophysiology uh, instead of her. This is our eye clinic that, was, um, that we had to move out uh, and was uh, demolished, uh, but we moved to a new clinic uh, in 2000. So, Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mrs. Wittmann. Η επιλογή της κυρίας Βίτμαρ να έρθει να μιλήσει δεν είναι τυχαία. Το, η πανεπιστημιακή κλινική, ο φαρμολογική πανεπιστημιακή κλινική της Λιμπιάνα είναι από τα μεγαλύτερα κέντρα νευροφαρμολογίας και ηλεκτροφυσιολογίας στην Ευρώπη. Uh, thank you very much, Martina. Okay, okay. thank you. You'll be back later. <laughs>